When I think of the version of Katara that we receive in Netflix's Avatar The Last Airbender adaptation, the first and only thing I can think about is the version of Katara in the play that the group goes to see in the Ember Island players in the original. This Katara is extremely over-sentimental and extremely one-dimensional, doing nothing but making dramatic speeches about the importance of hope and believing in oneself and others. It's a caricature of the actual Katara. And, yes, the other members of Team Avatar make fun of her a little when she suggests that she's not always making over emotional speeches about hope all the time. But Katara is right in the original. Yes, she does genuinely believe in the importance of hope. She has to. It keeps her back from despair and despondency. She believes that a better day will come. She believes that the sorrows and sufferings of today are not eternal, that something better than them awaits with the next sunrise. She has had to be burdened with a lot. She has had to take on a maternal role after her own mother died, and especially after their father, Hakoda, left, leaving her to care for both herself and Sokka. She appears at first to be rather naively optimistic to the point of being reductive, and Sokka even teases her about this in one of the early episodes. But Katara is not blindly hopeful. She has a lot of darkness in her. She has a lot of uncertainty. She has this vehement, almost overwhelming passion to correct what she sees as the injustices in the world, to create a fairer and more moral world that she can really care about and say is good and right and deserving of existing, a better world than the world that she lives in. She can go to extremes in pursuit of purging the, the world of what she believes to be wrong and immoral. Katara can fundamentally overlook or consciously ignore the moral boundaries set by others in her passion and vehement pursuit of what she believes to be a greater moral good. This manifests in small ways, such as when she decides to pilfer the waterbending scroll from the pirates, even though doing so places both herself and others in great danger. She feels bad about doing this, and she feels bad later when she lashes out at Aang. But... Her passion for connecting with her culture and for growing as a person and for setting right what she believes is incorrect and morally abhorrent, such as the fact that pirates have pilfered in the first place this important part of her culture and are selling it at a high price. All of this is 
so revolting to Katara that she takes action both for her own selfish benefit and for her own vision selfish as perhaps that might be a little bit of what the greater good is none of this is to suggest that Katara is immoral or even morally ambiguous she is a very caring and very tender and very thoughtful person she deeply loves those around her and that love motivates her to work devotedly to their benefit she, if anything she cares too much she cares too deeply about others and this passionate stubborn willingness to help those in need causes conflicts between her and Sokka such as in Imprisoned 106 and in the episode in which she visits a rundown depressed little town in need of a savior and she becomes that savior for them even if it's not the most practical thing for herself or them in 303 the painted lady this is who Katara is yes she does make these over emotional speeches but that's not all of her character she is much rawer much more vigorously passionate than that she will do anything to set right a world that has fundamentally fallen into a state of decay a state of injustice and immorality And sometimes she goes too far, and sometimes her decisions aren't always the best. But she keeps believing. She is deeply troubled by the death of her mother, deeply troubled by the sorrow in the world, and yet she does not give in to despair because she still has that hope. That is the context in which Katara's hope exists. It's not simply treacly sentimentality that the Ember Island players play treats it as such is funny because that's not who she is. Except in the Netflix version of Avatar, that is who she is. Katara is neutered for a lot of reasons in the Netflix adaptation of Avatar. Someone like William Hazlitt, the great uh, romantic era essayist and social critic, talks vehemently about, in terms of Shakespeare's plays, how character is the medium through which the ideas and passions and sensations of the work are fully realized. What allows that work to not just be a mere intellectual exercise in dramatic form, but a fully living, breathing work of wonder and emotional poignancy. Characters matter quite a lot. Take the same story, but flatten a few of its characters and the work is fundamentally lesser. I'm not saying Katara is the only problem with the thoroughly mediocre Netflix adaptation of Avatar, but she is the most obvious problem. Some of this has to do with the actress who is just not a good Katara. I'm not going to necessarily say that she's a bad actress, but she's bad in this. She does not have that fire. She does not have that vehement overwhelming passion that motivates Katara. Katara is a difficult role because one has to capture both her caring, sweet, 
constantly considerate motherliness. Her willingness to help all those she believes are in need of assistance. And this very passionate, very vehemently fiery person who is willing to disregard all decorum and even practical considerations if they stand in the way of her doing what she believes is morally just. That's a difficult balance. Katara is both selfless and quite selfish at times. When I say selfish, I don't mean in a bad way necessarily. I think it makes her interesting. She's not selfish in that she indulges in petty passions, that she steals from others or exploits others out of greed or arrogance. If she is selfish, it's that she is so, so committed to her very specific idea of what the good and the righteous is that it causes her to become somewhat blinded. Somewhat uh, prevented from seeing other ways of thinking, other perspectives. That's interesting. That balance is hard, and the actress does not understand that balance. But honestly, I don't think a lot of actresses could pull that off. Mae Whitman, in the original, did a phenomenal job. Easily one of the best performances in the original show. But the writing also fundamentally does not understand who Katara is. It does not understand her as a character. It's so strange when they make a few limp gestures at discussing how much of a great fighter Katara is. Especially toward the back half of the season, and how they make her entire arc, to the extent that she has one, about waterbending and just becoming a better waterbender. It's shallow, but it also doesn't even fit this basic iteration of Katara, who is just so inert. Whenever she's trying to be a cool fighter, I, I don't believe it. There, there's just no intensity. She's sweet and a bit timid. She is very much Sokka's younger sister in this Netflix version. Technically, she is younger than Sokka in the original as well, but the entire conceit of the original is that although Sokka portrays himself as this older warrior male protecting his village, a lot of that is projection and egotism that he ultimately needs to shed in order to embrace his true strengths, which are as an inventor, a tactician, the guy who comes up with the plans and orchestrates them. That is how he is a good warrior. It's much more than this kind of brute force way that he imagines being earlier. And it also has applications outside of war. He is genuinely passionate about inventing and trying out new and weird and creative ideas. And that's one part of his character I think the Netflix show portrayed quite accurately. But the other side of that is that Katara, though the younger sister, is the cohesive uniting force. She is not just sweetly sentimental, not just the one who always gives speeches about hope, but an extremely strong, protective, and thoughtful person who keeps others from falling into despair, even in dark and disturbing times. 
The Desert, episode 211, fundamentally showcases this better than any other episode of Avatar. Everyone else is lonely, miserable, anxious, caught in their own doubts and fears. Katara is the one who keeps the group together. She is the one who demonstrates the mix of resourcefulness, passion, and a sense of empathetic caring for the well-being of others to make sure the group does not degrade or break apart. This Katara is just completely flat. She is a completely empty facsimile of a human being. If I only watched the Netflix version, I would not like Katara at all. I would find her quite annoying, actually. When Sokka in the Netflix version reprimands his little sister Katara for acting like such a kid, I am fully on board with the Netflix Sokka. Katara does act like a rather naive, rather timid child who needs to mature. Nothing could be further from the truth in regards to the Katara in the original show, who is extremely mature, much more mature than she should have to be. She has seen and deeply felt great loss and sorrow. And it manifests both in her motherly devotion to caring for others, making sure they are doing well, that they're healthy, that they're taken care of, and yes, even acting like she knows what's best for them more than they know themselves. Manifest in that way, and also in her extreme ardor for combating the injustices and inequalities in the world. She is a fiery, caring, vibrantly passionate person who is not afraid at all to make a few questionable dubious decisions in order to forward what she believes is right for the causes that she believes in and the personal well-being of those around her. I love moments like when she steals the waterbending scroll or when she just decides to steal those clothes early on when they're uh, sneaking around the Fire Nation while Aang is scrupulous, Katara does not hesitate to bend the rules a bit. She is much more like Toph than Toph really understands, even as she also has this need to think about what's best for the group as a whole. And that's why episode 307, The Runaway, is so good. And this passion leads her to stumble sometimes. And it leads her to fall into the temptations set by others, like Jet in 110 in the original. Katara and Jet, that relationship fundamentally works in the original because Katara is like Jet. She does have that same vibrant, overwhelming volcanic desire to care for the weak and to fight injustice, even when it's not always the smartest or most philosophically sound thing to do, even when it manifests itself in rather unfortunate ways. Her deciding to walk away from that idea and to, after being betrayed by Jet, is important. This Katara does not have that level of devotion to a cause. She simply is the fake Katara in the Ember Island Players, so full of these overly idealistic platitudes about hope and bettering the world. But 
ultimately far too naive and childish to back up those dreamy proclamations with the fire and commitment to real action that motivate Katara in the original. So anyway, thank you all for watching. If you liked your stuff today, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Don't to my Patreon if you can, if you want to see more videos like this. Katara is one of my favorite characters in the original, and it's deeply disappointing to see her reduced to a flat, one-dimensional speaker of platitudes. But anyway, tune soon for next analysis. It will be coming soon. I promise you that. Thank you all again. Adios, comrades.